So for the benefit of all of you here, as well as our online <coughs> audience, the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us, we thank the USDOT for their ongoing support. It's greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as those participating via the internet. Uh, let me welcome the participants. Thank you. <coughs> got quite a few people here uh, online, so let me just name the organizations. We have representatives from Amtrak, uh, University of Birmingham, uh, Transnet Engineering, uh, LTK, New York State DOT, um, Patriot Rail, Metra, Sistra, Hanson Professional Services, um, Bowman Barrett and Associates, <coughs> Parsons, BNSF Railway, Train Dynamics, Patrick Engineering, HDR, CSX, Federal Transit Administration, AECOM, Ganesh, uh, Genesee and Wyoming, Mont McDonald, and Federal Railroad Administration, WSP, um, University <laughs> of British Columbia, Okanagan. I'm getting a nod from Tyler. Uh, LTK Engineering. So we welcome all of you. Glad that you could all tune in for this uh, seminar. And uh, <coughs> if you wish to receive PDHs for your participation, please uh, notify Emma at the um, same email address where you received the, uh, uh, I should say, in the seminar announcement. Most motive power in North America is provided by an electric drive system with power generated either by a diesel engine on board or from catenary or third rail. Concerns about local air quality and greenhouse gas emissions combined with uncertainty about economical fuel supply has led to exploration of alternative energy sources for rail vehicles. Our speaker today will discuss several alternative wayside and onboard options with particular focus on hydrogen fuel cells technology and its application in the rail sector. We really couldn't ask for a more qualified speaker on the topic today. He is Dr. Andreas Hofrichter. He's the Burkhardt Professor in Railway Management and the Director of the Center for Railway Research and Education in the Broad College of Business at Michigan State University. Dr. Hofrichter grew up in Trossingen, a small little town in uh, the Black Forest region of Germany. It's so close to Switzerland that I'm told you can see the Alps from yep. there. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> Andreas I was instead drawn to the railways in the region, and as a result, he developed his interest in rail transport. <coughs> he pursued this interest during his undergraduate studies in transport management at Aston University in England, where he completed the course with a first-class Bachelor of Science Honors degree. He then went on to complete his Master's in Railway Systems Engineering and Integration at the University of Birmingham, and continued there for his PhD investigating the suitability of hydrogen as an energy carrier for railway traction. This led to the development of a narrow-gauge prototype hydrogen hybrid locomotive, the first practical such vehicle in the United Kingdom. And his was actually the first PhD in the world on hydrogen-powered rail vehicles. And he went on to win the prize for the best PhD in the School of Electric and Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Birmingham in 2013. <coughs> Following completion of his PhD, he was employed as a teaching and research fellow in the Birmingham Center for Railway Research and Education, where he taught and developed several new modules, including in railway traction and railway business management. In 2014, Ms. Dr. Hofrister moved to the Warwick Manufacturing Group, which is an academic department at the University of Warwick, providing research, education, and knowledge transfer in engineering, manufacturing, technology. He led research on drive systems for rail vehicles, including energy storage hybrids and hydrogen fuel cell systems. In spring 2016, he joined Michigan State University in his current position to lead the development of their railway education and research activities. He has published several journal papers and presented at numerous international conferences. Please join me in welcoming, please join me in welcoming him for his presentation and overview of alternative motive power and hydrogen fuel cell propulsion for rail vehicles. Thank you, Chris. <coughs> well, thank you for the introduction, Chris. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, I'm notorious for going over time, so apologies for that upfront. I will probably go through some slides fairly quickly. Um, please keep your questions towards the end due to uh, timekeeping issues. Um, I hope it will be interesting. And well, yeah, let's get started. So what I'm going to talk about is, I first talk a little bit about um, established propulsion systems simply. So where are we today? 
and what are the issues with those and where are we going, <coughs> which is the second point, really the drivers for alternative propulsion. Then I'll talk a bit more on wayside options, um, followed by onboard options, and then I have um, quite a few additional slides largely on hy hydrogen fuel cell or hydrail options um, and how they could address some of these problems. Yeah, so my to my first point. Come on. Yep. So <coughs> we have two primary systems really for um, rail retraction right now. Um, either traditional electrification wayside, um, that's typically AC or DC, um, usually AC overhead, DC um, ground level, and that's been very well established. So the first actual commercial operation of that was um, in 1879 by Siemens in Berlin. Um, you had a third rail arm system, the return current going through the running rails, pretty much exactly what we do now. Um, then uh, Thomas Edison had a similar idea in 1880, used that, just the running rails for electricity supply, and there's a picture of the model of that. And this is fairly popular, and without any question, even today, if you are really performance driven, this is your best option, okay? You can get the best performance out of electrified um, railways, no matter what. Now, do you always need that? It's an entirely different story. Um, equally, is can you actually afford it? It's also a very different story. So often you have that in urban railways, um, subway systems, if you run a headway or the time between trains at around, let's say, two minutes, maybe five minutes, you will probably want to electrify. Anything below that, maybe not. It's probably not economically justified. Um, also, if you have a very high power and subsequent energy demand, uh, running very high-speed rail rail, uh, railways, something like the Shinkansen or the TGV networks or so on, you will probably also want to electrify or use another um, wayside option, which I come on to. Now, in North America, the most common way to propel, um, actually, trains is through onboard diesel engines. Um, usually, here, they are diesel electrics, so we have a diesel power plant on board that supplies electricity to traction motors and all, all of that. You have other transmission type systems in Europe. Diesel hydraulic is fairly common for multiple unit type of trains. And again, that has actually been fairly well established. It started really commercially in the US in the 1920s um, by GE with these types of um, locomotives as um, pictured here. <coughs> so a bit on third rail electrification. You basically have an additional running rail, uh, additional rail here next to the running rails that supplies the energy through a pickup shoe like that. So it could be top contact like here, or it could be a bottom contact like here. Um, here's a diagram for some of the um, other options. And that's always DC. You usually have something between 600 and 750 volts. Occasionally, that's a little bit higher. Because of um, the relatively high losses in electrical losses in such systems, you need um, fairly closely spaced substations for that. Um, and the power that you can actually transfer is fairly limited. So this tends to be, even today, fairly popular for underground um, systems because you need significantly less clearance um, for tunnels than you would do with um, overhead electrification. So the total system cost is actually lower, even taking that into account. The other big advantage is, is that you don't need a transformer on board, so you can um, have a little bit more space on the vehicle. But through newer technologies, transformers are actually becoming a lot lighter and significantly smaller. Um, overhead contact systems. Um, the electricity is uh, supplied through some sort of arrangement of overhead wires. Um, and then you have a pantograph here that makes contact with that overhead wire just to um, collect that electricity into the vehicle. That's typically AC. You see some DC legacy systems. But if you were to electrify a new rail railway, you would definitely do that with AC. Most likely a 25,000 volts overhead industrial frequency. So what do I mean with industrial frequency? That's um, the frequency that the um, public grid operates. So in North America, that's largely 60 hertz. In many other parts of the world, that's 50 hertz. If you really go to um, areas that are not very heavily populated, um, for example, some parts in um, South Africa, you can actually go up to um, 50,000 volts. <coughs> but that has its own issues on insulators and so on. Um, these locomotives are now fairly complicated. We start with an um, overhead single phase AC current, which is then um, stepped down through a transformer here to much lower voltage, um, depending 
on what vehicle you have, let's say between 1500 to 3000 volts, um, actually DC on a DC bus, then um, invert it over to three phase um, AC electricity to actually control the different motors. And we knew already um, around 1900 that from a pure performance and traction perspective, the three phase is the best way to actually control and run um, motors and locomotives. However, we didn't have any good way in um, creating and controlling that. So you could do that at the time, but that would lead to relatively complicated electrification infrastructure. So as you can see here, uh, you would have two overhead wires for two of the phases and the third phase would actually come through um, the running rails. This is really not that feasible um, over any longer distances. Hence this complicated or relatively complicated arrangement. Um, I'd like you to bear in mind, particularly this part from the DC bus down, because for pretty much all other onboard options that I'm going to describe, this doesn't change. What really changes is how do you supply the power um, at the front end. Um, issues with this is it's incredibly expensive. So um, roughly in North America, I would say about two million per single track kilometer. So if you have a double tra track railway or more, that's um, the electrification cost will be higher. If you're in the middle of nowhere and there's no public grid, you have to build that up as well. Again, it will be even um, more expensive now. You could say, oh great, I'm in an urban area. There's a very well established grid. Well, that has its own problems because it's very well established. So you have all sorts of other um, infrastructure issues that you have to deal with. So it's going to be more expensive too. So this is really a very rough number. Um, it depends a lot on the circumstances what the cost will actually be. Um, now, the other problem that you have, um, you can't see this too well here on the picture, unfortunately, but a little bit more here. Um, we could class that as visual pollution. So people don't particularly like all of the overhead wires and depending where you are, that's really a big deal. I would say it really has started in France and I come onto that where they said, no, nope, no way, we're not going to accept that in our historic um, town center and we want to move away from that. So a little bit more on um, the diesel um, electric motive power. This is um, a power car, that's what it would look like. You have the diesel engine and here then um, kind of your um, generator. And again, remember the diagram from earlier? Basically, if you go from the DC bus down, not very much has changed. This is the traditional DC um, traction control, whereas here is AC traction control, so largely this part here changes. And we have just, in quotation marks, supplemented the electric locomotive with its own power plant that we have put on board. So we have a diesel engine and a generator set, inverter and a rectifier, and clearly the diesel fuel. So by default, everything that a diesel electric locomotive could do, an electric locomotive can do, and more because this is really what is limiting uh, the power um, that you can have on board. So that's literally mass and space requirements. You can always match with electrification if you design properly whatever you do with diesel and you can usually exceed it. So if you have tons of money, that will be fun, simply by default and by design, because we are talking about an electric locomotive. Now, they're largely, sorry, a lot of you will actually know this, so there are quite a few background slides. Um, two types of combustion, internal combustion engines. You can either go with a spark ignition, which is what you would have in a car, or um, you can have the compression ignition or diesel cycle. Um, here is a um, diesel engine. In this case, um, I acknowledge it. It's from Cummins. It's not at Cummins. It's somewhere else. When people that know about this, it's red. So it's a Cummins engine, a rail diesel. Um, and you usually use diesels because you have a lot of torque um, in them. <coughs> so, which you don't get as much with a um, spark ignition cycle engine. You get very high efficiencies actually with a diesel engine. So modern ones in rail applications, your highest efficiency point, you're at around, I would say 45%. If you have stationary engines or if you have um, ship engines where you have significantly more space available, this can actually increase even further but simply the physical requirements are quite complicated. Now, realistically, you almost never operate at that particular point during um, a journey that you take with the train. You will accelerate, you will brake, you will coast, you will do all sorts of stuff. And that all sorts of stuff is called um, a duty cycle. And re realistically, for the entire drive system, including um, the losses in, the, in um, the electrical system, you're really looking somewhere between 18 and 25%. Now, 
If you have a locomotive that would be in idle a lot, let's say, for example, in um, switching operations, this can drop as low as 2 or 3 percent. So it's pretty terrible. So the duty cycle has an enormous impact in what your fuel consumption and your actual efficiency will be. <coughs> now, because diesel fuel is combusted with air, uh, that leads to all sorts of um, emissions, and I come on to emissions in a while. Yeah, actually, I'm coming on to it now. Here, my drivers for alternatives. So the first one is really fuel cost. Um, depending where you are, electricity is either fairly expensive or the same is true with diesel cost or gas oil, depending where you are in the world again, and how dependable that is. So I'm not talking about any of this running out anytime soon. That's not the question. The question is, at what price can we buy it? And even so, rail is a very large fuel consumer among the largest as an in industry. Realistically, we have almost no impact on that. Yes, we can do a little bit through hedging and all sorts of forecasting, but the cost of drivers are really driven um, by other sectors which we have no influence over, and politics. Now, one way to do this is then to increase your propulsion efficien efficiency to reduce your fuel consumption there. And there has been a lot of effort on that, and uh, diesel engines and so have been coming better to the figures that I just mentioned earlier. Infrastructure cost, as I already alluded to, and electrification is just crazy expensive. We can't, I can't really see, let's say, a BNSF electrifying from Chicago to Los Angeles or UP. It's just way too far, it's just way too expensive, unless through the new infrastructure program that the government has somewhat committed to and said, yep, sure, we're going to pay for that, which I don't see, um, that might be an option. However, even in lots of urban areas, um, this is often cost prohibitive. So that's the primar primary driver on the electrification side. The other part is energy security. Now, if you're lucky, like the United States or say um, Canada, where you have a lot of domestic oil resources um, and natural gas resources, that's not a big deal because you can supply definitely um, your transportation system with domestic sources. Now, if you're in Europe, that changes. Most of our energy is actually imported from um, other places, some of them more politically stable than others. That's a problem. So if there were any hostile actions in one way or another, then you have problems with actually running your transportation system and getting goods and people move. You can't really accept that. The one of the big examples of that was Switzerland. So Switzerland uh, has very little coal, has very little oil. Um, even around 1900, there was the First World War. The supply even decreased further. They had massive problems in actually running their railways, which was a major contributing factor to actually electrify the entire Swiss railway system. Now, there are only very, very short sections to industry deliveries or so that aren't electrified. But um, that is uh, still a concern. If you think of some of the older electrification projects in the US, for example, the Milwaukee Road over the Cascades, um, it no longer exists. That was also one of the issues. Yes, they would have had coal there, but they also had hydropower that they could simply utilize for their electrification. And being a mountainous terrain, you had all sorts of other advantages going with electrification. For example, no, no emissions at the point of use. So if you go through all sorts of tunnel and you s tunnels and you stall in there, you know, it's not a good idea to suffocate your passengers. Generally, people don't like that too much. It's, it's problematic. So um, electrification got around that. <coughs> Which brings me back um, to the second point, emissions. So the first bit is to comply with regulation and improve local air quality. So you could say, oh yeah, that's just uh, some of this new green movement in the last 20 years. The answer is no, it's not. So a famous case here in the United States is the greater New York City area. Um, that was again around 1908. Somebody can correct me if I got that date wrong. The city actually has said, hey, railway, there have been several um, issues in our tunnels, trains collapsing because the engineers couldn't see where they were going. You will not run any more steam trains in our city discussion over. We'll give you, I think it was about five years to implement that. So they were basically at the time forced to electrify for air quality issues. <coughs> Sometimes you do have a point that um, you want to improve performance, that you would actually go over to an alternative. You want a faster acceleration. Um, again, very typically the case for metros, really not so much in the long distance trains. You can cope with slower acceleration. 
um, attractive effort if you actually want to pull significantly more. That's the case um, in South Africa where they have started to electrify some of their lines. Um, the same is done through, through power transfer, again, the South African example. However, this is a very big point. Electrification by itself, the traditional wayside electrification is almost never economically viable. So if you run your railway system as a business, you will not um, electrify, generally speaking. All major electrification schemes in the world for the last 100 years or more have been one way or another subsidized by the government. So even the mighty Pennsylvania Railroad at the time when they electrified the Northeast Corridor got government bonds through lower interest rates or zero in interest rates to actually make it financially viable. There has been a very, or still is going on, a big electrification push in Europe. Um, I give an example in Britain, one of their major um, main lines, the Great Western, um, four tracks pretty much all the way, lots of different trains, ran on diesel successfully, high-speed diesel on about 125 miles an hour. They decided to electrify for performance reasons. Even there, again, don't quote me on the exact year, it's about 40 years until they actually recover all of that investment. So most businesses don't invest in a time horizon that's about 40 years. Now, what has been happening to fuel prices or diesel prices here in the US, this is data from the AAR, it's a bit spiky and let's call it somewhat unpredictable. If you run a business, you usually don't like unpredictable because you have um, to cope with all of that. You have to forecast it, you have to hedge it if you can. Um, but roughly, except for at the moment, and I believe it will go, will go back up, the question is just when. And if you know when, please tell me because then I can stop working here. I'll just bet a little bit. <laughs> so it will go back up, but let's say roughly for a long time, it has been between 20 and 25% of the operating cost for the class one railroads. So fuel is expensive. This really has a big impact on what we're doing. Now, if you're very concerned about the operating ratio, for example, like many of the investors are and um, certain CEOs, bringing that down will alter your um, operating ratio significantly in your favor. And your share prices go up and everybody's happy, right? Well, at least in theory. <laughs> so <coughs> Moving on to exhaust emissions. So um, I pick out two in particular for local air quality. We have um, nitrogen oxides that cause smog and we have particulate matter that causes cancer. Um, again, two things that we generally don't want in the uh, population and legislation limits um, these allowable emissions. Just to illustrate that, when you thought, hey, LA is bad, um, Beijing is a lot worse. Um, on the left, this is what it actually looks like. This is what it should look like. So um, you're breathing in all of that stuff. Well, we aren't, we are here. But people that actually live here, there is somewhat um, problematic, clearly for human health. So um, regulated emissions up so far, and most of you will be familiar with that, are the EPA um, emissions. Um, the tier one to tier four levels. We have reached tier four um, levels down here. And they are fairly restrictive. And most of the large diesel engine manufacturers, diesel locomotive manufacturers, had significant challenges to actually just meet these um, emission standards. So both of the big um, American ones, GE as well as um, EMD, or I think it's Progress Rail Locomotives now, I'm not sure. Um, they just changed their name recently. I call them EMD. So. Um, had issues in actually achieving these uh, standards. And I'll go a little bit into what you can do. Now, knowing, going back to this picture, that we want to avoid that and we want to get significantly better than that in urban areas, this is not enough. There will be additional legislation to limit um, emissions even further. Maybe less so under the current administration, but under a future administration for sure. And there are actually the cities and local communities themselves that um, limit these emissions and it will probably limit it even further in the future. And to support my point, here's California, yay or nay, depending on <laughs> what side um, you are. They have proposed from 2025 um, to the EPA, hey, could you please um, adopt more stringent tier five standards to push technology advancement? Um, an interesting part is overall greenhouse gas emissions are now actually included. They weren't included previously 
and the big deal, particularly for more urban railways, with capability for zero emissions in designated areas. What they really mean is urban areas. So that could potentially be switch yards, um, it could be more the light rail operation and metros that you have there. At the moment that has not been um, adopted by the EPA, but we'll see where it goes. The whole point is even if the EPA doesn't um, apply these standards in the current administration, there is a push to reduce um, emissions. Coming out a little bit, again, a refresher uh, for you to the greenhouse effect, which I want to start off with is a good thing. I love the greenhouse effect and all of you should because we would be dead if it wouldn't exist, okay? So life on the planet as we know would cease to exist without the greenhouse effect. Um, most of it is actually natural. Uh, the mass majority is actually through water vapor. So what happens is we have some solar radiation um, hitting the planet, being then reflected um, back either into um, space or trapped by greenhouse gases and reflected back to Earth, warming the overall um, planet. So pretty much like a blanket or like a greenhouse, hence um, greenhouse effect. So some of these greenhouse gases are worse than others and they have a bigger impact on the so-called global warming. And there has been discussion how much of that is man-made and how much isn't. The major greenhouse gases are water vapor, as I mentioned, we just can't compete with the oceans, right? Um, then there's carbon dioxide. Yeah, we have a lot to do with that, actually burning a lot of stuff. Then there's methane, which we also have a big contribution to, for example, a lot of agricultural activity, um, being livestock, being the rice fields, just as an example. And then you have nitrogen oxide, which also usually comes from the combustion. So <coughs> most of these greenhouse gases do occur naturally, even CO2 or methane occurs naturally. It's just a question of quantity. <coughs> the different greenhouse gases have a different impact on the overall um, warming of the climate. So a lot of the human activities here um, add to these, fossil fuel combustion, uh, um, um, agricultural activity, sorry, as well as some electric sparks. So if you think of substations or actually transmitting electricity, you often have seen, or plug in your iPhone or something, you see the little electric sparks. Through that, there is some air combustion. And through that, because you're combusting air, you will actually have some um, emissions. This is usually neglec neglected, but it is there. That also happens in a lot of um, power electronics um, production, for example. Most of the observations and models have actually been showing that the global uh, temperature is rising. And most scientists agree that um, we are at fault for that. The, uh, famous hockey stick graph, in case you've never seen it before. Um, you can simply see, yeah, it's been more or less the same, and boom, it just goes up, which kind of coincides with when we have actually started the Industrial Revolution and burning a lot of coal and other um, natural resources. So every greenhouse gas has a different impact on how much the planet is actually warming. That is called global warming potential, and as a proxy, um, CO2 has been chosen with a global warming um, potential of one. Now, if you look into methane, so natural gas, in, in, in other words, that's already significantly higher. And the same actually with um, the nitrogen oxide, that is also significantly higher. So what that means, if you switch your fuels over, let's say you switch from diesel or um, gasoline over to natural gas, and you get that natural gas from sources where you don't control any of the leaks, and you need only about a 4% leak, you're actually worse than you were before. So you need to really consider the entire supply chain of the energy and what's happening to the emissions to see if this is a sensible approach or not. <coughs> so usually um, the greenhouse effect of different um, gases is shown in CO2 equivalent. Okay, now a little bit on hydrocarbon fuel combustion. Um, again, this is probably a revision for most of you, but I wanted to drive this point home because that impacts a lot of the alternatives that we're actually going to talk about. <coughs> so um, hydrocarbons by name are fuels that consist of hydrogen of some sort and some type of carbon, duh, right? I mean, sometimes we scientists are incredibly in innovative, right? And coming up with names, it's great. 
Um, coal is one of the natural gas, another one, and then anything that's clearly um, crude oil or petroleum um, based. Now the combustion is a chemical process, again all of you know that, and you react oxygen with the hydrocarbon, and in many cases it's actually not pure oxygen, it will actually be air, and it's some of the issues that we have. And you get as a product water, most people don't realize, but you actually do get water as a part of your exhaust, and then some carbon dioxide. Now this is a word that I can't pronounce properly, some of you native American speakers, please pronounce this for me. So the perfect mixture between oxygen and fuel is called? Thank you. <laughs> yes, so um, I don't even attempt to pronounce it um, combustion. So yeah, I have the same problems as some others in the, o in the audience. And that gives you the exact amount of chemicals to have nothing else. So an example here with um, methane, which is relatively simple. You have one mole of methane, then you have um, two oxygens, and then you simply get CO2 and H2O. That's the um, ideal condition. And in lab conditions, we can get that. In the real world, we almost never get that. And this would actually be, that's um, very um, desirable. We would like that because a lot of the other emissions that I mentioned earlier impacting local air quality are not present in this type of equation. So where did it come from? A uh, little bit on petroleum-based fuels. Um, it's all from oil, and then you refine it differently. So you have here diesel oil, it's approximately here, and here you see what the chemical formulae actually are. Gasoline is uh, slightly higher, and then here you have gas, and you might have seen um, LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, that's really what we're talking about here. Now because of the reactants that we actually have, and again, very often that is uh, being misrepresented, so I make a point here. Your CO2 emissions are linearly, linear, linearly ah, proportional to fuel combustion. Oh, sorry, fuel consumption and combustion, clearly. And for diesel, you have approximately 2.6 um, kilograms of CO2. So that's good news and that's bad news. The bad news is, well, if you don't change the fuel, we can't really do very much about it. That's not so good. The good news is, for anything that we do to conserve and make um, diesel engines or any other engines more efficient, we are automatically reducing the amount of CO2 that this vehicle will be um, emitting. So it's a win-win situation. It's good from an operational perspective, but it's also good from an environmental perspective. Now, what does air look like? Um, so the majority of the air that we're actually breathing is nitrogen. Then we have some oxygen and then a composition of some sort of other gases. Now the combustion with air, because we don't have that pure, CO, uh, pure oxygen, leads um, to emissions. So at high temperatures, and we have these high temperatures in our combustion process, um, oxygen and nitrogen react together, and we get also called NOx. And they were bad because of what? I've already lost all of you. That's, that's not so good. It was, yes, that was the nitrous oxide. What else was bad with NOx? Smog, yeah. So as, as long as we use air, we will have issues with that, no matter what fuel we're going to use, because da, there's air. Now, reduction strategies is, well, you can have a lower combustion temperature, then you get rid of some of the NOx. You can reduce the excess oxygen, then again, you get fewer NOx and we often have after-treatment solutions. And that's really what has been going on in um, the diesel sector as well, on the road as well as on, um, on rail. So one of the techniques is that you use some of the exhaust gas and then you recirculate that in your combustion process. So you replace the air with some of the exhaust gas. So you have less spare oxygen, um, you have less nitrogen, and therefore you get um, fewer NOx, quite simply. Another um, option is you have um, selective catalytic reduction. So this is an after-treatment solution where this um, isn't. You use um, some kind of other chemical, usually it's ammonia-based, that you then um, inject into the exhaust gas um, to change this composition. So that you convert your NOx um, over to water and a little bit of CO2. And again, um, you have seen this. So it's one of the brand names that you see for diesel cars for the after-treatment fluid would be um, AdBlue. Um, I think for the rail applications and trucks, it's call, usually called DEF, um, all sorts of different names, but this is basically what this is doing. 
That's the nitrogen part of the problem. The other part now, the carbon-based part, is you have other um, emissions through incomplete combustion because, as I've shown earlier with, with methane, if you would have complete combustion, you would just get CO2. Um, you have other emissions than water and CO2, as I said. So hydrocarbons, what's hydrocarbons? Okay, <laughs> I answered the question. This is basically unburned fuel, right? So if you go to your local um, gasoline and diesel dealer, let's say Shell or something, and you pick up the pump and you just take it and say, oh man, this Shell smells amazing. That's that sort of stuff. <laughs> <You just laughs> so um, it's all of the unburned fuel that comes out, in this case, out of the exhaust pipe. So even so, it smells really good, and you just want loads of it. Actually, it's really unhealthy for you. Um, I don't know, you know, Coke gets away with it. Unfortunately, Shell and so doesn't. Never mind. <coughs> so the other part um, that you have then is some sort of pure carbon. So and c imagine it a little bit like coal. Okay, it's not quite coal because uh, because coal has more water content, but it's very similar to coal. So you have just such build up. So if you have an old-fashioned chimney in your home where you use coal or um, wood to combust that, and you never clean your chimney, occasionally you get chimney fires. It's because um, you set that suit on fire. Um, looks fun, not so good for your house, but it looks cool. Um, and you have a particulate matter, so that's very small types of particles of carbon that you inhale. And then they just basically stuck to, um, to your inner organs. Think a little bit of like smoking, okay? You just inhale some stuff and it gets stuck to your lungs and to in your inner organs. Now, what to deal with that problem, what an after-treatment solution, any of them, basically try to do is let's just complete this um, combustion process one way or another. Now, the options is, well, let's increase the amount of oxygen that we actually put into our combustion process. Sounds great, right? So we get more um, CO2. So we reduce our um, exhaust gas recirculation. Damn, we just increased our NOx. So, well, good for one thing, not so good for the other thing. Then um, the other option is that you um, control the oxidation later on through an after-treatment. Think a little bit of a sponge. Um, you just have your gas flowing through. It's all collected in kind of a, a big sponge. If it gets too full, like your chimney, you just, con um, in a controlled manner, just burn it off with oxygen um, afterwards. And that's exactly what they're doing right now. The biggest dilemma here has been um, how do we control um, the NOx the same with um, the carbon-based emissions because the strategies are really competing with each other. And that's what the manufacturers have been really dealing with and uh, has prevented them to come up with solutions fairly quickly. And they invested an awful lot of money in all of the after-treatment systems for um, diesel locomotives. So now, if we want to get rid of anything that has nitrogen and anything that has carbon, on our propulsion systems, we have two main ways in how we can do that. One way is we have some way wayside power supply. So our classic electrification will deal with that. And depending where the electricity comes from, that's a really good solution. We have almost no local emissions, maybe a little bit of um, the NOx because electric arcs, but really not that much. But what do you do if all of your electricity comes from coal-fired coal power stations? For example, in Poland or here in um, the Rocky Mountain states. You could potentially be worse off than you were with diesel in the first place. You just have transferred the problem to a different location. And I know this is somewhat contro controversial, but arguably the Western world has been doing this with their production anyway. We just shifted to China. So if it's pollution in China, who cares? It's not pollution in my backyard, right? So I would say in a more global perspective, we really shouldn't look at it like that. But, you know, a lot of our emission accounting also has actually been going that way. <coughs> now, some other options, because electrification is really effect, um, expensive and, let's say, ugly in simple terms. We could have inductive loops, okay? We just put uh, some of that underground and transfer the power that way. We could have advanced ground-level electrification. If you remember the third rail example, it actually didn't have such a big impact on um, the visual landscape. We could have linear motors. Uh, we could have, if you want to go really fast, magnetic levitation. 
and I could add on to that, if you just put maglev into a vacuum tube, you have Hyperloop, which receives an awful lot of attention right now. And I'm slightly simplifying it, but not massively. This is basically what we're talking about. So Hyperloop would be a railway, an incredibly expensive railway, <laughs> but um, it would still be there. So the other option is, if we don't want to go with anything waist height because it's um, expensive, let's do something on board. So um, here we could have some energy storage devices, let's say flywheels and batteries and supercapacitors. Um, that reduces usually the consumption that you have on board and it will allow you to um, operate for certain distances and certain duty cycles without any other primary power source. Or we use alternative fuels or energy carriers. Now, first I'm going to talk about the wayside options a little bit more. And to keep you all awake, I have from now on a few videos within the presentation. <coughs> now, first, inductive loops. This idea isn't new. That has been done all by around the 1900s as well. The primary issue has been in the past that you lose an awful lot of um, your electricity in this type of power transfer. So typically that has been around 80% loss. They have largely overcome that and we are now significantly more efficient and has pretty much reversed. You know, about 80% of the electricity is actually transferred. And all of you know that. Well, no, I take that back. The majority of, no of you will have an experience with inductive power transfer. Who has an electric toothbrush? Okay, one, two. Well, if you have an electric toothbrush <laughs> and you charge it and you just uh, put it on your station overnight, there's no direct electrical uh, connection that is actually going through inductive charging. Clearly, very close to each other, but this is how it's working. The other, if you're really technologically advanced and you have super modern cars or something or lots of money to spare, please consider me as well if, you, if that would be the case. You might buy inductive charges for your um, smartphone devices and you simply just place it on there and it charges I exactly the same technology. We're now just talking about that doing that on a much bigger scale to propel rail vehicles. The other thing that's different, we can't have it touching quite clearly because you would have a lot of um, friction on there. So there has to be a gap between um, your collector on the vehicle and the infrastructure. A good idea because we have no third rail or overhead electrification. Oh, it's not ugly. Actually, we can't see it at all. Great. It increases resilience because uh, think of some states um, and countries where it gets freezing rain. In Germany, for example, you can get that. And you have lots of freezing rain. What happens to your power lines? Um, in exactly. So they build up a nice layer of ice and ice doesn't conduct. So your trains just stop. They have some um, infamous examples in Germany, one of the high speed, very high speed trains, one of the premium products on Christmas Eve. And it started um, with freezing rain and in pretty much the entire north, the rail system stopped completely. Now you didn't have anything resilience either. So also the heating went off and the lighting went off. So people were freezing and oh my God, and it was a massive uh, public outcry. So we kind of have to deal with that. So these are real problems. The other bit that can happen, is if you don't take it off and you just leave it there, it could get r remarkably heavy. And I believe um, you had some problems of that here in the US on power transmission, where they just simply fall over or the cables rip off. Yeah, also not really what we want. So this is kind of um, uh, problematic. So in Denver, for example, on their light rail system, which is electrified, and they do have some issues with that, they run trains throughout the night with particular pantographs that literally just break the eyes off to counteract some of these problems. Now, if you don't have any sort of this infrastructure, you don't care. Whatever, yeah, let it be freezing rain. You still have your inductive power transfer. So from a resilience perspective, this is actually quite interesting. <coughs> Unfortunately, at the moment, it's even more expensive than conventional electrification. So um, unless you have money like nothing, and there are not many of us that are in that fortunate position, you will consider this um, fairly carefully. This type of stuff is also being discussed and actually used in some applications for electric cars and electric buses. and. Even so, it has actually been started with rail. This receives significantly more attention, clearly, because usually that's what happens with road transport. And some examples here on a test track in um, Augsburg in Germany and the Nanjing Tram. And now I really hope technology will work and the video plays. All of these videos, um, by the way, I have a slide at the end. They're just from YouTube, they're not mine. Um, if you want to go back and look at them, feel free.
Right, so the video is actually longer, but um, please feel free to watch it longer. And I should acknowledge, in case you haven't seen it, this is a Bombardier commercial video that kind of illustrates the point that I was trying to make. There are other manufacturers that are doing the same thing. Now, advanced ground level electrification. So these pictures are here in Bordeaux. You use an advanced third rail technology, which is only energized, very similar to the video earlier, when the vehicle is actually over the third rail, and you put it into um, the ground, so it's nowhere, um, nowhere visible. So here you would have this extremely ugly um, overhead electrification system in Bordeaux versus here, parts in the actual historic town center where you have eliminated all of that. So if you ask my humble opinion, which I know you don't, but you will get it anyway, um, <laughs> I don't think this is particularly ugly, but um, too ugly for the French, or at least the people living in Bordeaux. So we want to get rid of that and replace it with this. So here you can see um, the third rail in the middle um, that actually is then activated and simply um, the traditional contact made. Um, reduces visual impact. At the time when I was writing this, um, and well, I have the information for that's about seven years old now, it was approximately nine times as expensive as traditional electrification. I'm sure the cost has come down somewhat, but still, this is not cheap. Now, linear motors. Um, that's another very good way in how we can do things. And we no longer rely actually on the wheel-rail interface to make our propulsion and braking effort. That's great. So all of the issues that we have with kind of um, traction control and braking and wheel spin and wheel slip, and sliding, go away, because we have uh, this um, linear motor here. These two pictures are from Vancouver Skytrain. Um, you, in this case, you have here just a metal plate in the middle, and the active part is on the vehicle, so it still has electrification here on the side, but you don't have to do that. You could simply reverse that. Reduces visual impact, again, no overhead catenary. Um, improves performance, as I already mentioned. It's also used in most of the maglev type of systems. It's, again, significantly more expensive than anything um, of conventional electrification. If you're a train geek like me, you love Vancouver Skytrain. You don't just love it because it has um, on two of its three lines linear motors since 1985, but it's also fully autonomous. So actually, you know, we're talking about autonomous, ca autonomous cars, autonomous trucks, and so on. Well, we've been doing it since 1985. So actually, the automotive industry could potentially learn from rail and how we have been doing that. We have been doing it with a fairly expensive infrastructure, but we have been doing it for a long time. So we know how to do it if we want to. Um, maglev, the other wayside option, if you want to go really fast, uh, that has usually been um, the approach, but it has actually been, like most um, other cases, implemented on local, relatively slow speed transfers um, systems first, so airport systems, for example. So you use uh, electromagnets instead of wheels. You kind of lift or push uh, the train up. It improves performance as you have no wheel rail contact at all. Uh, the technology isn't new, as I already described. It allows very high speeds. So by far the fastest um, land-based kind of rail vehicle is in Japan right now and their maglev system on test runs. But it's ex extremely expensive. So as many of you might know, um, the Chinese are building a very, um, a very large network of very high-speed rail lines up to 350 kilometers of an hour commercial operation. They exceed some in test runs with conventional technology. They knew and they tested the maglev technology first and still decided to go with conventional high-speed rail instead. Now, I, again, I have a video which I will be cutting short at one point that explains the linear motor concept and maglev a little bit, um, so you also have an idea of what is happening on SkyTrain. Flying at zero altitude at a speed of 267 miles per hour, the Shanghai Trans Rapid offers the utmost in safety, comfort, and punctuality. The Trans Rapid Magnet System, an entirely new train system, the first to overcome the limitations of wheel and rail. Because the vehicle moves entirely without contact, it makes train travel faster, easier on the environment, and more economical. The functions of the wheel and rail on a normal railroad, including support, guidance, propulsion, and braking, are accomplished in 
the trans rapid through an electromagnetic levitation and propulsion system. Mechanics have been replaced by electronics. Support magnets draw the vehicle towards the guideway from below, while guidance magnets hold it laterally on track. These support and guidance magnets are mounted on both sides of the vehicle along its entire length. An electronic control system ensures that it levitates at a constant height of 10 millimeters above the guideway. While levitating, the vehicle has 15 centimeters of clearance. The magnet train is propelled and braked by a synchronous, long stator linear motor. This motor is not located in the vehicle itself, but rather in the guideway. It functions on the same principle as a traditional rotating electrical motor whose stator has been cut open, unrolled, and stretched lengthwise along both sides of the guideway. But instead of a rotating magnetic field, a traveling magnetic field is generated in the windings, one that pulls the vehicle along the guideway without contact. Flying at zero altitude. Okay, I come to my second last part. I really need to hurry up here. Sorry about that. We have um, onboard different options. So one of the ways to uh, reduce fuel consumptions and emissions is why do we have to have one big diesel engine on board of a locomotive? Why couldn't we have several small ones and switch them on and off and how we need them? That's the concept behind the so-called gen sets. And they do exist and they do run. Um, yeah, you have simply um, several, usually three, different gen sets on board of a locomotive and you turn them on and off as needed, exactly as I just described. You reduce emissions, um, you reduce fuel consumption, at least in theory. And however, you need a fairly um, complicated and well, quickly reactant traction control system. And I know um, that at least with the early versions of these, there have been issues with that. So this hasn't been working too well and um, that has had some problems with the railroads actually adopting them and many railroads that actually have them don't use them very much for that reason. You can overcome that and I believe the all of the upgrades that have been issued since actually deal with that. So it could result in lower reliability because you suddenly have three engines that you have to look after, but it could also result in higher reliability of your train service because if one fails and it's properly designed, you still have two others to actually just haul you home. Now. A quick graph on um, general energy density, and that's why we're basically addicted to all of the liquefied fuels. Here's diesel fuel and gasoline. <coughs> and by the way, the from the graph here, this is the field where you want to be in. That's the good news type of field. This is the bad news type of field in when you actually want to install stuff on, um, on the vehicle. So batteries and also even the top performing batteries are fairly low. So that means you need either a ton of them well, it does, it does mean you need a ton of them um, if you want to go any distance or you can't go very far. <coughs> um, super capacitors are around there as well on this graph. Now, here CNG, you're looking pretty good on a per mass basis, but you're not looking very good at a per volume basis, so that means you need a lot of space to install the tanks. The same is uh, true for um, LPG or LNG here, um, and hydrogen is also not that great here. So what can you do about that? You either use a lot more space and a lot more mass to get the same that you want, or you improve the onboard um, efficiencies of your power converters so that you can actually counteract a lot of that. And this is exactly what's happening on the hydrogen fuel cell side. <coughs> a little bit on regenerative braking, and here this curve is just on the potential because that's important for all of the hybrids. You have here um, the speed of the vehicle. Here you have the distance between how often it actually breaks. And then simply at the wheel level, how much energy could you potentially, theoretically, recover um, through um, using that braking energy? And the main point that um, takeaway that I'd like you to have here is that the stopping distance 
is really or what drives it home, much, le much less than the speed. Yes, the speed is important, as you can see, but if you stop frequently, your potential to actually get a lot of energy back through regenerative braking is significantly higher. So anything where you have a duty cycle, where you stop a lot, this is a really good idea. So if you have alre already electrified systems, frequently you can just pull push the electricity back into the overhead or into the ground rail, for example. So clearly for metros, light rail applications, good idea. On the freight side, where do you stop a lot? So switching. So any kind of switching locomotives as well as road switching, your duty cycle, you actually stop fairly frequently. Whereas if you go long distance, um, let's say reasonably fast trains um, on the Transcon, just as an example, again, you don't stop very much. So the potential that you have is significantly lower. So you really don't invest a lot of money and effort into trying to get a mainline locomotive as a hybrid because your return will simply not be there. Now, these have been done. There have been um, several um, hybrid vehicles around, um, including in freight um, applications. Also here in Japan, in um, regional train applications, these are all diesel hybrids. Um, the other option is that you use the electrification infrastructure um, only for part of it. You recharge the batteries and then you simply um, move along for some time on your energy storage device. Now this energy storage device could be flywheels, it could be super capacitive and it could be batteries. Um, there are several reasons for that, but usually you actually go with um, batteries if you have any longer distances that you want to cover and you have any longer period of um, downtime. The other thing that you can do is that you can actually downsize your primary power plant, let's say your diesel um, engine generator set. If you have a lot of um, stopping and the duty cycle has lots of big peaks, and the average power is significantly lower, like in shunting, for example, you will have peak powers of around 1.2 megawatts, but frequently your actual average power is just 100 kilowatts. So through the batteries, it would allow you to install a significantly smaller prime mover, making a huge difference to your emissions and to your overall fuel consumption. Again, they had some teasing issues with these locomotives. The batteries went on fire quite a lot, which is, <laughs> which is generally not what you, what you like, you know? It's, it's so you exactly, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, if you choose an appropriate battery chemistry, that will not be an issue. But at the time, um, that was a problem also with the control. You could go simply with just batteries on board or energy storage devices that you then um, recharge at certain intervals. The Tesla model, basically Tesla for rail. And Tesla for rail looks like this. Norfolk Southern on um, 999, for example, they tested these sorts of locomotives. It doesn't look quite as sexy as a Tesla, right? Don't they? <laughs> you know? Um, other options are um, different type of um, tramways. In light rail, this is actually being used more and more. And I do have a video on how that works, but in the interest of time, I will actually skip that. And you basically have here, as you can see, the overhead electrification infrastructure is just here at the stop. The pantograph goes up, you charge the batteries, you move to the next stop, and you do exactly the same again, basically. Again, this could be very interesting also for um, switching a road switching application in the freight field. But depending where you actually travel, you might need quite a lot of these. So it could be still fairly uh, infrastructure um, intensive. Also, as you've seen earlier on the inductive charging, if you don't want this, which is cheaper than inductive charging, you can put the inductive charges underneath so you can't even see it. <coughs> and al another alternative is biofuels. And a lot of my examples have been fairly um, international based. Good news here for the US, you're the leading country in the world on rail and actually doing that. You have here, that black part here, you have the highest mix of biofuels in your standard um, diesel for rail propulsion. And there have been several trials in actually increasing that even further. So one of them was, for example, the Amtrak Heartland Flyer, um, which might have even traveled around here, I don't know the exact route where they uh, used a 20% blend of biofuel. There have been some other um, examples in other countries where they went up to 80%. So this is definitely an option. But you still have a hydrocarbon. So you will still get all of the emissions that you had. So you say, well, yeah, but greenhouse gas emissions will be completely different. Well, maybe. <laughs> and um, the rule of thumb is if that biofuel came from areas that were, let's say, pasture land on fairly flat before and you just grow stuff, good news for the atmosphere. If you 
um, just burn down forests instead and build all of the fields there. Bad news, the overall <laughs> thing looks um, worse than with diesel in the first place. Just a rule of thumb. Clearly there's more science into that, but that's usually how it works, um, uh, works out. Natural gas. Yeah, Napa Valley wine train. If you really want to, do it. They've been doing it for quite a while. Uh, they were running on natural gas. You can uh, reduce your overall greenhouse gas emissions. Why? Because your carbon content is actually lower than um, it would be with diesel. But you might still have a lot of your issues with your local emissions. So typically in all of the natural gas projects, you went from a tier zero or tier one locomotive to a tier three, not to a tier four. So you would still need a lot of the after treatment stuff that I've been talking about earlier to meet tier four emissions or anything that's higher. <coughs> Now, the prime mover for natural gas can be a compression ignition engine, so i.e. a diesel engine. It um, could be um, basically a car engine, or it could be a turbine. And depending where you are in the world, uh, different things have been used for that. For compressed natural gas, um, you have a limited operating range, so not so good for your mainline service, but pretty good for all of your um, switching and road switching. Um, and it's less complex than liquefied natural gas, which is what you would use for your mainline locomotives. And typically, you can't run LNG in a combustion engine just without any diesel. You usually have about a 20% diesel mix to um, turn up um, your engine to get it all started, and then you replace it successively with natural gas. And at the higher notch settings, uh, you will run purely a natural gas. Um, and that's typically what's used by EMD and uh, GE conversion kits. And usually your efficiency of the combustion is slightly lower than you would have with diesel in the first place. <coughs> Now a bit more on the CNG, as I already said, the Napa Valley wine train. There have been several examples, usually in North America using spark ignition engines. And here is a Norfolk Southern project, and here is a, a project in, uh, in Russia. And you can see here much more the kind of tank that they have been using. Um, Indiana Harbor Belt is not so far from here. They've been using quite a lot of CNG locomotives. If you go with LNG, um, and you want to do this more on the mainline type of applications, you will need uh, some sort of kind of big storage tank. Um, for people that have grown up with steam locomotives somehow, that was called a tender at the time, and we uh, chose to adopt a similar um, word for that again, a little like this here, or like that here. Um, these are clearly North American examples with um, basically diesel engines and the substitution that I just mentioned. This here is a, a turbine locomotive that they use in Russia instead. So, <coughs> yeah, the main point here, because I've mentioned everything else already, is Florida East Coast has converted their entire mainline fleet now over to natural gas. And it's in the full commercial operation. So if you really want to see a lot there, um, this is an interesting case. Now, eventually I'm coming on to hydrogen. So what uh, first I'll talk a little bit on what is actually hydrogen. So if you want to have non-carbon-based fuels, which we want because we don't want any carbon emissions, you have two options on chemical fuels. You either go with ammonia and you're basically interested in the hydrogen or you go with hydrogen in the first place. Now you can see here there's the nitrogen in it. So if you use ammonia, which you can simply combust in an, in an engine, you get enormous amounts of um, NOx levels. So in the Second World War that has been happening in some of the countries because of our fuel supply shortage, for an example, so we can't really go with that. Now, hydrogen, first, uh, I want to make clear, it's not a fuel. It is an energy carrier. It's a bit like electricity. It, ha it has to produce be produced from something else. And that something else could be all sorts of things. So here is one graph. You can produce it from electric um, electricity and splitting water. You can produce it from different types of biomass. You can um, produce it from coal if you want to. And depending where you are, um, there some options are cheaper than others and the emission factors are different from one another. Clearly, if you use renewable electricity and you split water, you have no emissions, whereas if you use, use coal, you will have a lot of emissions, but the coal product is probably cheaper. So here in North America, the most common way of producing hydrogen right now is actually from natural gas through steam methane reforming, and this is the plant what it looks like. It's a very common element on Earth and in the universe. It's actually the most common one in um, the universe, so we won't run out of it. Um, it's non-toxic, non -toxic, so if something would go wrong and you inhale it, you're going to be fine, unless there's too much of it and then you suffocate, but that's true for pretty much everything. Um, it's not a greenhouse gas by itself, so if it leaks in one way or another, you don't have to worry from that perspective. 
Yeah, and um, reduction of greenhouse gases, as I mentioned, is possible depending on how you produce it. Now, um, I talk a little bit about a, a fuel cell hybrid, and I first talk about a hybrid part and then a bit about fuel cells. You remember this diagram, I hope, from earlier. So basically, we're still talking about an electric locomotive. But what I have done here is I added some energy storage devices. Let's say these are batteries because of the duty cycles that I mentioned earlier that can make sense. And we've replaced the diesel engine generator set simply with um, a fuel, cell, a fuel um, cell system. Now, what is a fuel cell? It combines the hydrogen with um, the oxygen from the air, so on just the oxygen, which is a good idea. So we leave the nitrogen completely alone. So then um, through that, you pass the hydrogen that uh, splits and creates an um, electric current and then recombines um, here with the oxygen to form water. So you basically um, just create water. You create electri electricity, heat, and water. We can live with that. You know, water is not that dangerous unless there are large, large quantities and you drown. But typically, that doesn't happen in vehicles. So <coughs> now on the efficiency perspective, this is where this is really interesting. What we really want out of most of the fuel cells is the electricity. Um, here, this is um, examples from actually the test car fleets. This is um, from 2012, and I couldn't find another nice graph um, like that since then, unfortunately. But you can see here, um, basically, the line follows. You, um, you move up, then at approximately a quarter of the maximum power, you have your highest efficiency point, and then it declines. Now here, um, the 2016 results from that study show <coughs> um, where you can get. So this is the ultimate target, which was a 60%. We are at 57% um, on average. And here you have uh, some of the best performers in the range. And we're actually reaching 59 already with some of the manufacturers. So we're pretty much there. More importantly, on your hybrid actual um, propulsion system is this number here, that you can um, get a very high efficiency, even if you run it at full power because that's how you will size your power plant and the rest your batteries will cover. So roughly, what does that mean? Just again, um, over the thumb approximately, or finger in the air. Approximately twice the overall efficiency that you can achieve with the diesel engine duty cycle, which is pretty good. Plus you have zero emissions. Now, if you think back of that energy um, efficiency graph, we simply moved that dot on the energy storage that we need um, over to the, the right significantly and further up higher, so getting closer to diesel. You still need more if you want to have the same exact same range, but not that much more. <coughs> now, um, there have been several trials on that. So um, vehicle projects in BNSF is arguably the most famous here in North America, um, has tested one of these hydrogen fuel cell locomotives um, in 2009. It was largely designed as a proof of concept rather than full service operation basically showing, does it actually work in any way? And the answer is yes, it did work. It did. It worked very well. And I know from the engineers that actually operated the vehicle that they were extremely happy with it. One of the very positive comments that they had is, oh, it responds really quickly. It responds much, much faster than what we could do with um, a diesel, which is clear because you have your batteries in there, so you have instantaneous power transfer. So here, this compartment here would be your fuel cell system. Up here, this is your um, hydrogen storage. And this block is your battery. At the time, they used lead-acid batteries because they were very easily available and they were fairly cheap. And you know, with demonstration projects, money is usually an issue. <coughs> so most of um, what has been done so far was focused on light rail and lower power applications and regional trains. Metrolinx in Toronto is currently considering to use hydrail locomotives instead of traditional electrification for their network. Why is that interesting for freight? Their locomotives are as powerful as the majority of the fleet here in North America um, on the freight side. We're looking at 4,400 horsepower type locomotives. Lots of different um, proof of concepts. We had here the switch locomotive. We had some rail cars in Japan. Commercial vehicles are now available. You can buy trams and light rail vehicles as well um, as regional trains. As I mentioned, no harmful emissions. It can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, as I mentioned already. It reduces fuel consumption. So one of my um, studies in the past on a particular duty cycle has shown a 55% fuel consumption compared to diesel, well to wheel, and about 72% um, reduction in CO2 if the hydrogen would come from natural gas, which again is uh, actually fairly impressive. And remember, zero harmful emissions at the point of use. Um, here, this is one of the TIGM trams. Um, 
old style looking because that's what the client wanted, very new technology in there. Um, because I didn't, or we as a team, didn't have millions, we just had a few ten thousands. This is um, our locomotive. Um, the principles behind it are exactly the same. I have a video on here, but again, I will actually skip that. You want to see the video of, who wants to see the video of my train? Well, okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> then <laughs> I'll show it. So. so this has been developed by a team um, at the University of Birmingham. The other interesting part that you will see um, in this picture here is that it's remotely controlled from a tablet. This is acceleration up a hill. So that was in 2012, just um, to give you an idea of timeline. Now, I'll give you the most exciting project right now worldwide is uh, this one here. Um, Alstom has decided to build some hydrogen-powered regional trains. The range is between 600 and 800 kilometers. That's what the operators needed. The refueling takes only 15 minutes. You know only you need to refuel once a day. So compare that with batteries, what would take a lot longer. Um, 350 bar hydrogen storage tanks. A reduction of 40% CO2 on most of their cycles, zero if they were to use green hydrogen, clearly. Uh, you have on each rail car a um, fuel cell module of about 200 kilowatts, 225 um, kilowatt battery power. So overall it's more powerful than the diesel version that it actually replaces. And so you could get higher acceleration with that and a top speed of around 140 kilometers an hour. And I will show you the video of that because then you can see that, yes, this is also m possible at a much higher um, scale. This is the second last slide. And they have nice promotional music, which I don't have. So it's not the technology of the future, it's the technology of today. So we can do this if we really want to. And in the freight context, again, I, I will uh, reiterate that. On type of road switching and switching applications, this is entirely feasible. Anything on the regional train perspective, this is entirely feasible. Anything on the light rail perspective, this is entirely feasible and we can do that now. We need clearly, because it's a conservative industry, demonstrate pro demonstrator projects to show, yes, this is possible. Yes, it will work in North America because physics is different here than it is in Europe, clearly. So we do need this type of demonstration projects. And yes, there will be some issues on supply. Yes, there will be some teasing problems with any, like with any new technology, but it's possible. It's not like this is 10 years or so away. It's here now. Now, a brief summary slide um, <laughs> from Anything that I have been talking about wh while you were sleeping um, is <laughs> um, we have established traction systems. We have, um, I wasn't looking at anybody, right? Chris, right? Hi. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we are talking about um, electrification or onboard diesels to actually power electric locomotives. That's what we have been doing, what we have been doing for quite a while. Electrification, 
without any doubt, anything else that I've been showing you has the best performance aside from linear motors and maglev, expensive wayside options, which you don't see a lot. But electrification is very expensive. So if you don't have tons of money, you probably don't want to do that. The main drivers are uh, for any alternatives to those are the cost impacts and um, emissions. You have several other wayside options. I mentioned maglev, inductive loops, for example, or recharging of batteries and hybrids. Um, where was I? Yeah, Alter alternative fuels and energy carriers can help you to get rid of all of the carbon that you actually have in the fuel, so you have no carbon emissions. And hydrogen or hydrail, if it's applied to railway vehicles, if you Google that term, you will find quite a lot on that, is possible now. It's a very interesting technology. Uh, it solves a lot of the energy security issues. It solves a lot of local air quality issues. It can get you quite far. That's it. You survive. <laughs> Um, compared to what? To, to what the traditional um, municipal railroads use, uh, the most basic of the like the or okay. the kind of that they are uh, Yeah. So um, your question for the benefit of the online just summarize it? Yes, I, uh, I will. So uh, basically, if I got the question correct, and you can correct me if I didn't, is um, how does hydrail technology compare with um, either conventional diesel or wayside electrification on initial investment as well as operating cost? Yay! <laughs> so the answer is it's more expensive. So no, the answer is it's partially more expensive. So it's more expensive than diesel because the diesel technology is very well established and it's cheap. Um, I would say at the moment you look at, at around, and that's very high level, around three times more expensive on the capital cost. However, your operating costs are significantly lower because um, you can get fuel often cheaper. So at the time in LA in 2009, hydrogen was cheaper than diesel at the time. Plus you have your above 50% um, fuel saving and you have fewer um, moving parts. So overall the maintenance requirement is significantly lower. So your operating costs are lower. Um, compared to electrification, it's um, also cheaper. So the vehicles themselves will probably be slightly more expensive, but you're probably looking more at one and a half times more expensive. You have no um, overhead electrification infrastructure, so therefore all of that cost goes away. So the Chinese um, CRC and their light rail example at the prototype stage, and a stretched prototype stage, they're saying it's about the same price. So as soon as you build more, it will actually be cheaper. They do, yes, that's right. Uh, I, so my question is, uh, what will be your opinion? Is that will be a future thing in zero pricing? Or using a high performance engine or other things in terms of linear? Okay, um, I repeat the question. Again, the question is that the hydrogen train, hydrogen train that I have been showing from Alstom is operating in Germany. Yes, that's correct. And would that technology be um, feasible for um, other European countries or other countries around the world? And the answer is yes. So I know for a fact that Alstom, um, because they have told me, <laughs> um, that they had um, inquiries from many different countries, many different European countries, but also international countries. And actually, um, their statement was, we were surprised how popular it would be. They have more demand for it than they were anticipating. And it was originally four four or five German states that have ordered these types of trains. They're building 60 of them. There are already um, other German states that want more and have um, started on that process and signing contracts. There's interest in France, in the UK, in the Scandinavian countries, just as examples. What other industry or class of business actually uses hydrogen? Yes, they do. So, so, the, que so yeah, the question was, do other um, transportation sectors um, use hydrogen fuel cell technology? And the answer is yes. So the most um, commercially successful so far has been in warehouses uh, replacing fork forklift trucks that were previously battery powered or natural gas powered. 
And the reason is that you can, you have a better performance, so you can replace um, your fleet with a smaller fleet. So compared to natural gas, you clearly don't have any emissions within uh, the warehouse, which you want to avoid. Compared to batteries that take quite a while to recharge, even with quick recharging of, let's say, um, 30 minutes to 80% capacity, mm, it's only 80% capacity, you refuel a forklift within two to three minutes and you just um, go further. And also what you have with batteries over time, the power that you can get out of them um, actually decreases the longer you use it. You don't have that problem with uh, fuel cells, will always be the same power. So Walmart, Amazon and others here in the US have been switching over to fuel cell forklifts. On the car and road transportation side, yes, all major manufacturers, or almost all major manufacturers have fuel cell car projects. Um, some of them have launched them commercially. If you're lucky enough to live in California, you can buy a hydrogen fuel cell car from Hyundai, Honda, and Toyota. Um, General Motors has been involved in the projects for quite a while, and they wanted to launch a car um, this year, but they have pushed that timeline back, exactly the same as Mercedes and Ford and Nissan, and I could continue. Yeah. I should have anticipated that question, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and I did. So the question was, are there any um, safety issues with using hydrogen, particularly on rail? And the answer is yes and no. So I'll answer it that way. Even diesel and gasoline is not particularly safe, right? I mean, it's flammable, it's toxic, it has all sorts of uh, harmful um, fumes and so on, but we just learn to live with it. From many perspectives, hydrogen is actually safer on that. It's non-toxic um, and it's not harmful, um, well, non-toxic and it's not an inhalation hazard, so you don't have the kind of smoke issues and so on. However, you do have um, to use compressed gas tanks or you have to liquefy it, and so this is one of the hazards that you have a higher compression. And um, your flammability limit is fairly high. So you go from about 4% to, ooh, the higher limit I think is 87, but um, I would have to double check in what I've been writing before. The advantage is it's the lightest em ele element, so it dissipates very quickly into air. So as long as you're in open space, you really don't have much, much issues. The comment from the firefighters in the BNSF project was, so you're basically telling me once I get here, it's all over? Yes. <laughs> so So the question was, um, would hydrogen fuel cell locomotives be um, cost competitive with conventional diesel um, locomotives for heavy haul freight? And the answer is yes and no. So the answer is on the capital investment upfront, no. If you consider the life cycle um, cost with fuel, the answer might be completely different. But that study hasn't been done. Well, I'm involved in some studies and the results will be published soon, but um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the question was, what would be some of the challenges to implementing hydrail um, technology in the current North American market, particularly with all of the kind of sunk capital in the um, traditional technology? So there have been several projects, including the BNSF project, where we have used an existing platform, and we basically, um, actually I go back on, on the slides, uh, here, we basically retain, oops, sorry, we basically retain all of the electric drivetrain, and we just make, in quotation marks, we just make some additions 
to that. So we replaced the current fuel cell, um, the current diesel electric uh, power plant with a fuel cell power plant and we will most likely add some energy storage. That can be done on an existing platform, so you don't necessarily have to buy all new locomotives. Even so, if you would want a high performance mainline locomotive, most likely you would probably buy a new locomotive. And yes, that is definitely one of the, the big problems if you have already a big fleet with sunk investment in those. However, I wouldn't start with the uh, high power mainline fleet either. I would start with the lower power applications because um, first they're easier to achieve and you can learn more on the technology and actually it behaves. And the fleets don't tend to travel over the network as much. Yes, switching and road switching locomotives are interchanged between different yards, but you could more easily get around that. So start on the lower power applications. Most of that fleet is actually fairly old and needs upgrades anyway. Um, so if you would want to do that, you could even retain the um, existing DC drive. Let's say we take all of the gem sets and the green goats that are out there and convert them over. That would definitely be possible. Now, the other part of that is clearly the refueling infrastructure. And again, for the more localized fleets, that would be much easier to implement. And if you have that in certain kind of locations, then you fill in the network um, that way, rather than trying to run hydrogen power trains over a very long distance, let's say Los Angeles to Chicago. Don't start with that again. Start in the LA area, start in the Chicago area, and then slowly fill in. Does that answer the question? Okay, so um, I repeat the question again. So that was a follow-up question. Would um, be hydrogen-powered locomotives um, able to be multiple unit compatible with the existing equipment? Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the answer is yes, because that's on the control side. You're largely, um, again, talking about here, the main uh, traction control where the multiple unit capability and control comes in. And uh, yes, you would have to have some um, programming challenges in actually making that happen. The bigger problem would be then, again, where's the refueling infrastructure? And if that isn't there, then you would potentially have to drag it um, as dead weight until another one exists. And that's then operationally interesting if you really want to do that or not. Any other questions? 